the preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Thank you so much. That's, I don't believe all of that myself. <laughs> you clearly know that I'm not Erica Jong, and I'm sorry, <laughs> I will say that um, <clears throat> We have at least uh, lived up to one uh, thing that, that you're told by detective story writers, people always do when they go into disguise. We've kept the same initials. <laughs> um, I have a lot of notes here which may confuse me, but um, when I told Vivian Siegel, she asked me what I was going to talk about, and I said, what is the series about? And she says, well, she said, well, it's about politics and the arts. And I said, well, why don't we just put women in, and I'll talk about women politics and the arts. And uh, 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 then I said, if I, if I change my mind, I'll talk about something else, and I'll tell the audience when I get there. But in fact, thinking about, uh, about this, I almost stuck economics in as well. Part of what I want to say to you is that the world is not fragmented uh, and that our society has succeeded in fragmenting it too much. Uh, women, politics, economics, the arts, communication, uh, which is a particularly literary form of the arts, all need to be seen in relationship to each other. They need to be put together a great deal more than uh, they have been. We have been defining our world and breaking it up into small hunks and failing to see how these pieces affect each other. Um, if we talk for a while, and Vivian said that you perhaps had had not enough people talking about the arts in, in this series, and uh, uh, my art is, is literature. If we uh, begin, at any rate, by talking about literature as she is writ today, uh, I think we will find a, quite an interesting example of a difference between literature written by women and literature written by men. Now, let me uh, say at once that I don't believe that this is because men and women are born different from each other. The overlap of a common humanity is, in my opinion, practically total. I think that a great deal of socializing a process of socialization is necessary in order to turn women into women, and also in order to turn men into men, or little girls into women, and little boys into men. And this, again, is an example of a kind of fragmentation of life, which I feel has gone much too far, and which is weakening our whole society. However, it exists. And we can see this very thoroughly if we consider the kind of books, the kind of novels which sell awfully well when they're written by women, and on the other hand, the kind of novels which sell awfully well when they're written by men. Men's writing today, I, I, uh, I'd like to know about Joseph Heller. Has he been or is he coming? Or are you voting? He's coming. <laughs> well, uh, this novel of his, it seems to me, is, is exactly uh, an example of what I want to talk about in, uh, as the novel written by men today. Philip Roth does something of the same thing. Mailer has done something of the same thing, both of them in a different way. But uh, Heller's new novel is uh, a brilliant, he's a fine, fine writer, a brilliant example of what happens to people who have been socialized by this process of creating men out of little boys into believing that their proper place in the world, their proper role in the world, bars them from the experience of connection, love, tenderness, 
expression of emotion openly and uh, directs them to believe that men are pretty much aggressive, can be angry in public, but not much else in public, uh, shouldn't cry in public. You all know what happened to Senator Muskie after his unfortunate uh, experience of bursting into tears during the New Hampshire primary in 1972 when he was both angry and distressed by the uh, treatment which, had, uh, which his wife had received in, in the press. Uh, Heller's book is about a man who can't feel. I'm sure he'll tell you a lot more about it than I can, but this, this aspect I will point up. He does not feel a connection. Uh, Heller uh, on uh, the Today Show, uh, I remember, talking about his book, said, this man has a speech impediment. He can't say, I love you. Uh, in this world, drained of the ability uh, to connect, to say, I love you, to reach out, the world becomes reduced to absurdity, a very empty, very desert-like condition. This is a world, alas, uh, which is celebrated and uh, uh, I think correctly so in a great deal of the novels, the good fiction written by men today. Uh, Roth has done it in, in other ways. Uh, Mailer has uh, celebrated, uh, you might say, aggression in the sense of the attempt of a man to control the whole world brilliantly. All of these books are excellent books. All of them write about a human situation, which I think is deplorable and which uh, perhaps in time, perhaps in quick time, will cease to be. Another aspect, I think, is that a good deal of the um, rather more avant-garde and special, perhaps, r novels written by men today m move into a total, an area of total absurdity. In, in which, uh, since you cannot connect, since you are alone in the world, in which you cannot say, I love you, you find the world absurd, and you then write about the absurdity. This has been uh, done with charm and humor by uh, Donald Bothelme, for instance, whose, uh, whose writing I, found, I find uh, delightful for a while, but uh, the effect is to set up a sort of what? Oh, a very fine, narrow sketch of the world as we know it. Not, in my opinion, the living world of human uh, multiplicity, which is the one that we all know. <clears throat> Now, there has been, uh, I would say, or we can discover in, in this world something else about our relationships between men and women today. Uh, because women are allowed to be tender, to say I love you, to connect, to express their emotions, to cry in public. Uh, it's interesting to see that the fact that women are also considered to be the second and inferior sex has by itself devalued, disvalued these emotions and these expressions of emotions. Uh, for men, the normal behavior of women is held to be abnormal, and yet in many other uh, centuries, and in certain other ethnic uh, uh, groups today, the expression of emotion is, is much more natural. So I think we can say that uh, really the expression of emotion is hardly an abnormal human capacity. And yet, uh, in our time and in this place, it has been becoming so. Uh, the result is, the further result, 
Men who want to have emotion expressed to them to feel a return of tenderness are not getting full value, even from the women who are able to say back to them, I love you, who are able to say back to them, I value you, <laughs> who are able to respond and open up and give them the support of love and affection that they need. Now, why are they not getting full value back? Because these are inferior creatures. They, when they are told that they are valuable by women, and this is back in the back of the head of many, many a man, they are being told so by someone who is not their equal. Uh, you know, if uh, I remember writing once in one of my novels that it wasn't uh, a, a man who said to himself, well, it isn't uh, much if I'm uh, the friend of a friendly man. Uh, it, it doesn't do you an awful lot of good. It doesn't help you to value yourself highly if the person who says, I value your hi you highly, is not valued highly by you. You see, you, you're getting short change there. And this is, in fact, a, uh, another part of our present situation. If, uh, if a playboy bunny says, oh my, what a great guy, well, you know, uh, you don't think of her as actually being a woman. Uh, not simply flesh and blood, but mind as well, and yet she is, you know. If you stamp her with the stereotype and say, that's, that's a bunny, she's a groupie, you know, she she'll w wants anything, well, then what she wants from you and what she gives back to you ceases to be something which is truly important to you and therefore which can really validate your own sense of yourself, your own value for yourself. In this way, this is another way in which our fragmentation, our division between the sexes has played us, has, has done us harm. <clears throat> and in fact has created that really very lonely world which Heller is writing about and which Roth has written about and which uh, Mailer attempts to overcome with a kind of, of um, by, as I suggested, the effort to control it and make it his in that sense. Now, uh, part of the response to this, of course, is that as the women's movement has grown, women have begun to refuse to accept simply the position of inferiority and of being an object who is there to return something to you. I, I should perhaps just pause for a moment to say that uh, when uh, Vivian Siegel was introducing me, she suggested that it was the women's movement which had had a great deal to do with the social changes that we see around us now. Uh, I, I don't think so, Vivian. I think the social changes which we see around us now have produced the women's movement, that it is in fact a response to enormous and long-term social change and that this is the, the, its solid basis in the real world and the reason why it will continue and will uh, eventually, uh, with, with other uh, movements as well, begin to get our heads up to where our bodies are. It will get us to clear the mythic thinking out of our brains and look at the world as it is. Then, of course, we'll make some more myths, but at least they'll be a little more uh, related to where we are now. Uh, now, the uh, women's refusal to accept the inferior status uh, is increasing. Uh, it is a hard thing to do if you have been brought up to believe that you are somebody who uh, is not terribly well fitted to cope with the world as it is, not capable of making large-scale uh, decisions, uh, that, you know, you have a kind of um, nitty-gritty, everyday sort of mind and capacity, but uh, the big questions you'd better hand over to somebody else. If, and, and this has been the, the kind of role which implicitly has been, uh, little girls have been directed to. If, if you've bought all this, then it's awfully hard to suddenly find yourself in middle or later life having to say, well, I'm going to change my life. You know, I'm not going to live by, by the old rules. People are forced to it, however, because of that changed 
reality. They do find that they are, in fact, in positions in which it is necessary for them to make decisions, and they discover that it isn't all that hard, that it really does, uh, does stick, that, it is, that they are perfectly capable human beings uh, and not abnormal. But, as I say, it takes a while. However, we've begun. And, of course, this, in, uh, again, has had an effect upon men which shows up in, in men's writing. Uh, good whole men uh, find it very satisfying to have a good whole woman uh, to respond to them. Men who do value women find that their response is more valuable, as I've been suggesting. But uh, it takes, this too takes a while, and there are many good men who are only slowly feeling their way toward this. Uh, they are frightened of change. Most of us are frightened of change most of the time. We don't know what to do about it, what's expected of us, how do we react, what's the proper thing to do. The nice thing about social statics is you know what to do. You, there are rules of behavior that are going to work. You know how to seat a dinner party, you know how to write thank you notes, you know, all this kind of business on a much larger scale. Uh, when change begins to happen and you have to improvise every time you're in a new situation, you get tired <laughs> and you realize that you're going to make mistakes and nobody terribly likes to make mistakes. It's hard and it's harder for the people who are not undertaking it, not beginning it, not originating it, that is men. Women who are conscious of the need for change often see it as an opportunity, find it stimulating. Uh, they can imagine new ways to behave and go out and behave that way and get a new response. Very, very exciting. But if, uh, if you're not doing that, if, it's, if you see no particular need for change, you are not going to be as, uh, as pleased and you are going to be frightened by the kind of change that is taking place. You will discover, I'm sure you have, in reading uh, books, uh, reactions of this kind, to move away from fiction for a moment. George Gilder uh, uh, in, uh, oh dear, what was the name of that book? Came out last year. He's got a new one coming, and it's all about the desolate bachelor and how terribly sad he is, and, and nobody loves him, and so on. Uh, I said to George when we were both speaking together down in Virginia that his description of the people he was writing about told me exactly why nobody loved them. <laughs> I mean, if anybody who was a four times loser called me up for a date, I'd be inclined to say, alas, I'm awfully sorry, but I seem to have made a, you know, I seem to be playing hockey that day or something. <laughs> uh, well, uh, to sum up, uh, men assigned women uh, a role over the centuries, over the millennia, little by little society has done this, in which uh, women are seen as object, as being second, inferior, and other. All those things which Simone de Beauvoir wrote about with such brilliance 20 whole years ago, you know. Uh, in so doing, they devalued the response of women to them, and they also degraded the value of tender emotion, connecting emotion, and the expression of, demotion, of emotion. Uh, let's now look briefly at what is going on in most of the books that women write. Not all of them, of course. There are always exceptions. This is a world of emotions. It is a world of personal relations, very important personal relations, uh, people. Um, you can call it soap opera if you want, and in fact some male critics have called it soap opera. I wrote in my first book about women, Man's World, Woman's Play, something about soap opera, and when I desperately set out to try and find it, I discovered it wasn't in the index, so I couldn't read it to you. But I, I, what I did write, uh, I can <laughs> reproduce, which was that soap opera tends to pose important questions of relationships, of human relationships. Then it, it, they, the questions are answered in the most banal and vulgar and superficial way. But soap opera holds people because uh, on television, it's one of the very few uh, things that you see on television which is talking about important questions. I mean, if you're looking at, at Beverly Hillbillies, I don't know, is that still on, I guess, but the, the, all those entertainment programs, 
tend to be uh, about very superficial and artificial kinds of human situations. Soap opera, at least, is talking about um, your relationship to your children, your investment in them, your uh, marital relationships, your kin, all this kind of thing, the connections that we owe to people. So uh, I don't uh, think that um, that there's, I mean, I can see very well why soap opera has been so popular and so important on television for so long. At present, um, a great deal of women's writing still sees women um, as caught in that traditional role in which they were inferior second uh, objects. And, uh, However, the impact of some movement away from that, of resentment against it, has produced a spate of novels in which uh, this makes people unhappy. Now, the heroines of, of many a novel, I guess, uh, it's treated in any number of ways. Perhaps Lois Gould has, has done it. Joan Didion did it uh, very magnificently in, in Play It As It Lays. Sue Kaufman in The Diary of a Mad Housewife is doing it in a, uh, um, well, a, a bit lighter way. Anne Royfe has, has moved toward the absurdity in, in uh, Up the Sandbox and so on. You see that all, all of the things, every time a world becomes a little bit unbearable in literature, you move a little bit toward absurdity and we begin to get the novel or the theater of, of uh, the absurd. Um, these, these novels, uh, uh, I must say, they put me off, quite a lot of them. And, and I, it isn't that uh, I, I don't think they are written by good writers, nor do I doubt that they are true. This is a perfectly uh, irritating itch on my part. I get terribly tired of heroines who are self-pitying or are in positions in which uh, they call on my pity, and when which I think they really ought to be able to get out of that mess by themselves if they just had the backbone to stand up and say something. You'd say, well, now you can't really read a novel that way. It's not right to do it to the novel. But it is the effect that a certain number of uh, these books uh, have on, on me at any rate. Uh, but it, we've got to realize that what they are about is still a true situation. They are recording that the old rules by which women were socialized to behave aren't working anymore, and the pain, and the pity, and the resentment but impotence at the same time is a very true expression of what is happening in the lives of many and many a woman. In fact, women have got so used to being blamed for failures in personal relationships that when they become conscious of failures in personal relationships, they, be, they blame themselves. Now, a great deal of the personal relationships which are difficult today are not the fault of the people involved in them. They are the product of social change. And one of the things that women have said in uh, discovering themselves uh, becoming a part of the women's movement in going to consciousness raising groups, one of the great values they have found is that something that they thought was a personal experience of their own that they felt guilty about was happening to an awful lot of other women. In other words, that something which they had been bearing alone each woman by herself blaming herself for was in fact happening to so many people that it simply couldn't be her own fault. And this is an indication of how the changes in our world have affected, have weakened, have made inoperative the traditional proper behavior of women in their lives, including in personal situations. The, um, David McClelland of, of uh, Harvard, the head of that, uh, what is it, the social, the, one of the big sociology departments up there, uh, speaks of women as having a sense of responsibility about managing emotions. And when the emotions begin to go wrong, when you can't reach your children for, some, for, for an obvious example, women do feel very guilty. Uh, about this and tend not to see that because of the rapidity of social change, because of the fact that there is very little 
actual process of life which families two generations do together anymore as they did 50 or 60 years ago. Uh, this is a, a social fact and one which has pulled the generations apart. You, you cannot be as close to your children if you have never worked at something together. You simply don't know each other in a processual working way. When people lived on farms and the family uh, on family farms or in little uh, businesses where a generation would succeed another, you'd get a great deal of intergenerational work, processual interaction, not just socializing. And this is something which we have lost through social change. So that's one uh, one example of, of the kind of thing I'm talking about. Uh, here, uh, when women feel guilty, it's a false guilt, and it's a very, that's a very destroying thing, because you can't do anything about false guilt. If you're really guilty of something, you can remedy it, even if all you do is say, I'm sorry, I'm conscious of what I've done. Uh, I can't make up for it, but do realize that I'm feeling terribly about this, and will try to avoid it in the future, or something like that. But false guilt, you can't do anything about because it, it, you've, you've misread the situation and consequently you carry it around with you and, and uh, eat yourself out. Well, um, the, uh, I have one little note here and I'm not sure where I want to read you something now. Um, this, this reaction, in other words, to women's present experience is a true reaction. They are true descriptions, but they are sort of loser's reactions. And um, here, I think I will uh, read you a, uh, something which um, was sent me the other day. Uh, Two other women and I will be speaking at the Modern Language Association for the uh, Commission on the Status of Women there. And this is a paper, which I'm doing a terrible thing by reading you a bit of, because I haven't got the permission of the people who, person who, woman who wrote the paper. I hope she won't mind, and I intend to tell her, but it came in the mail only yesterday, and I couldn't get hold of her. It's a general statement. She is a, a professor at one of the city colleges. Uh, I won't go further into identifying her. It's just a very general statement, but she puts it so well that I wanted to read you uh, this because it, it sort of goes on from what I've been saying. In the women's studies classrooms of the college at which she teaches, one of the most commonly observed phenomena is a depression that sets in in midterm. A sense of hopelessness engendered by the parade of female characters seduced and abandoned in worlds old and new, victimized by psychotherapy, by marriage, by the whole spectrum of social forces. The woman as victim is an enervating spectacle with an ambiguous message. See, she was having the same reaction that I was. Rebel, or possibly give up. <laughs> what then is to be done? The reality, this reality of oppression is all too real. Even the lives of successful women viewed close up are not that encouraging. The term sex object is the clue, writes our professor. It was natural that the first period of women's studies in literature should focus on images of women and find among those images a dominant image of the sex object and her horrid converse, the killer female, and that field of inquiry is still rich in unmined social and aesthetic perceptions. But a shift needs to be made to include, and in some way transcend, the image of woman as sex object and victim, the image of women as subjects. We need to observe women in their dealings with both sex and power as acting and perceiving, not only as being acted upon and being perceived. It is that distinction, the distinction between subject and object, that can counter without dishonesty the personal sense of hopelessness. We cannot change the history, even the current history, of our many defeats, including most painfully the defeats we are laid to visit on ourselves. We can only treat literature and perhaps distinguish between literatures on the basis of their ability to imagine all characters, not as objects, but as subjects, 
or you might say, as agents. <clears throat> Even when secret agents. Women as agonists, though not always protagonists. The material is there, mainly in books written by women, but also in books written by men who are not prisoners of sex. And then she names some of the male writers who have written about women in a different way, and I regret to tell you that they are all dead. Shaw, Ibsen, Meredith, Gissing, and I would add Chekhov, whom I think has done some of the most magnificent creation of living women of all classes in, in any literature. Well, uh, I brought along Erica Jong's Fear of Flying, since Erica couldn't be here, because it is a perfect example of a book in which the heroine is beginning to transcend this. Uh, I may tell you that uh, Erica asked me to read the galleys of her book, and I did with great pleasure and amusement and, and uh, laughed like a fool. But the one thing she asked me when uh, I called her up to say how much I'd enjoyed it was, Isadora isn't a loser, is she? I don't want her to be a loser, and I got terribly worried about that, thinking about it afterwards, which I might say parenthetically is a thing that happens to novelists. When you're through and the book's gone into galleys and you can't really change anything, you sit there and have nightmares about how you didn't really get to say what you meant to say and it's going to be come out differently. Well, uh, I assured her that uh, Isadora was not uh, a loser, that she is a seeker for happiness. Uh, when she returns to her husband, which she does in the end, it is not with a sense of guilt, but rather a sense that now she can because she comes to him as an equal and not a supplicant. It's a new situation between them, therefore, and since she's fond of him and he believes, uh, since he's, she believes he's fond of her, perhaps they can work it out and get on. She's willing to give it a try. And I thought I would read you from A Fear of Flying, just the uh, brief, less than a page passage, in which um, Isadora is, is uh, deciding that she can do this, and in, in which she is sort of saying to herself, uh, I am a person who may be able to cope. Uh, she... Uh, um, is, is looking through um, a notebook in which, uh, which she'd kept and, and made, uh, written down things in, in felt tip pens of all colors. And I'm sure that many others here besides myself have a stable of about six in which we write things on different days when we feel like using a turquoise instead of a red. Uh, well, at any rate, uh, this is the notebook. Uh, I flipped pages wildly, looking for some clue to my predicament, that is, what she was to do next. The earlier pages of the notebook were from my days in Heidelberg. Here were excruciating descriptions of fights Bennett, her husband, and I had had, verbatim reports of our worst scenes, descriptions of my analysis with Dr. Happa, or perhaps he's pronounced happy, I'm not sure, it's an ambiguous spelling, descriptions of my struggles to write. God, I had almost forgotten how miserable I was then and how lonely. I had forgotten how utterly cold and ungiving Bennett had been. Why should a bad ma marriage have been so much more compelling than no marriage? Why had I clung to my misery so? Why did I believe it was all I had? You see, the description of the self-pity and impotence and, and uh, beating on the breast kind of that goes with the first situation. As I read the novel, I, as I read the notebook, I began to dr be drawn into it as into a novel. I almost began to forget that I had written it. And then a curious revelation started to dawn. I stopped blaming myself. It was that simple. Perhaps my finally running away was not due to malice on my part, nor to any disloyalty I need apologize for. Perhaps it was a kind of loyalty to myself a drastic but necessary way of changing my life. You did not have to apologize for wanting to own your own soul. Your soul belonged to you, for better or for worse. When all was said and done, it was all you had. Marriage was tricky because in some ways it was always a folie à deux. At times you scarcely knew where your own lunacies left off and those of your spouse began. You tended to blame yourself too much or not enough or for the wrong things, and you tended to confuse dependency with love. 
I went on reading, and with each page I grew more philosophical. I knew I did not want to return to the marriage described in that notebook. If Bennett and I got back together again, it would have to be under very different circumstances. And if we did not, I knew I would survive. And it is with that, it was with that feeling that Isadora did go back to see and try. In other words, what she was going back to was not so much an open marriage as an adult marriage in which each person, person uh, regards and is regarded by the other as mature, responsible, and capable of looking after his or herself. Now, this is not a sentence to sameness, to being exactly the same kind of person, having the same kind of reactions, doing the same kind of thing. There is really no need, and in fact it's incorrect, to imagine that equality between the sexes means that each sex does exactly what the other does. Rather, it is mutual respect between them for what the other does, and a pleasure in the sharing of the experience of the other. Marriage can be very much enriched by different ex the different experience which each partner brings to it. But unless each partner is indeed respected, that experience will not be valued. It will not be enriching because it will not be seen as the equivalent of the experience of the other. It is, in other words, not a sameness but an equivalence of valuation that really is equality. Uh, Doris Lessing's last book is, again tells the story, The Summer Before the Dark, I haven't read the new one, uh, of um, a woman finding her own valuation through taking on any number of other uh, variants on the woman's role, the traditional role, and finally discovering that, yes, she will do most of it, but she returns to it with a different sense of herself. That happens also to be a novel which was so dreadfully reviewed that you don't know that if, you've all, all, if all that you have read are the reviews. A friend of mine, Carolyn Kaiser, the poet who has lectured here a number of times and read here, and I were both at a party in Washington uh, last fall, and uh, we happened to get talking about this and seized Bill McPherson of the Washington Post, the, the uh, book editor, and Carolyn's six foot one, I think. I'm, I can't match up to that. But at any rate, we, we uh, simply attacked McPherson and, and told him about Doris Lessing and complained about the reviews and, and the, uh, uh, the sense in which the experience that she was writing about was simply too hard for most of the men re reviewers to understand. They assumed that when she stopped dyeing her hair, it was a defeat. It wasn't at all. It was that this was the one thing she said, this is ridiculous, and, and there's no earthly reason why I should go on doing this. It was a symbol of the fact that she had integrated herself into someone whom she respected and therefore assumed that other people would respect, and she didn't have to dye her hair in order to please them. Well. Uh, un un enough of that. Uh, time is getting on, and I actually would like to read you something I wrote myself. Um, I said I'd talk about politics, and perhaps this will show you what I mean by politics, which is not particularly sexual politics as between individuals. Um, what is needed is that both in politics and in literature, men and women take each other seriously, which means that men take women seriously and women take themselves seriously, because up till now we really haven't. That doesn't mean to overvalue yourself or be solemn about yourself, but simply to assume that your judgment and your experience mean as much in the world, carry as much weight as that of other human beings, i.e. men. Uh, politics, I don't think, will begin to do this, really, until literature begins to. Our, our, that's, that's the reason for literature. It's written by people who have insight of some kind into the present situation, not by prophets, but simply by people who can see where a process is tending and, and uh, what is going to happen uh, because of what is going on now. <coughs> Our politics is still in that state of division in which 
human response is cut off from decisive action. And the result is that each sex is ignoring half of the resources that we have in the world today. I don't think that we can afford to do this. Uh, the, in the political world, we are still very much living by the male norms and standards, and they have begun to drain that world of meaning, of significance. We do not see uh, groups who are not in power as the human equivalent of groups which are in power. They can be ignored. Their uh, reactions can be uh, um, overlooked. Now, of course, that it's interesting that when that is done, there is, again, a pervasive sense of guilt that goes with it. I mean, if you read some of, of uh, if you consider the actions of, of the Nixon White House in, in opposition to uh, those they uh, took to be their enemies, you realize that paranoia was running in full tide. I mean, they, there was one poor little man with a, with a um, um, you know, a signboard out in Lafayette Park uh, attacking the Vietnam policy of, of Nixon, and they had a whole squad mobilized to go out and remove him. You know, what was he doing out there? He was amusing the pigeons. You'd think he had a laser beam instead of a sign. Well, this uh, uh, kind of thing is, 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 again, where the failure to understand the significance of other human beings results in the falling into absurdity of a human situation. I believe that women's experience can be used to refresh the tired, worn out, despairing, liable to fall into absurdity male attitudes. Now I will close, if I may, by reading the end of this last book of mine because I think it is pertinent to both women, literature, and politics. I've been wondering lately whether there is not a useful and revealing analogy to be, draw to be drawn between the position of women today and that of the middle classes at the beginning of modern times. It was the bourgeoisie which embodied the expansive forces that ended the limitations laid on society by the feudal structure of the Middle Ages. There have been arguments aplenty among historians as to whether the bourgeoisie really represented a progressive force in this period or not, but if we leave aside the value judgment implied by the word progressive, we can agree that this new class of merchants and traders and makers of goods for sale and heapers up of capital for future investment did function as the instrument which smashed hierarchical feudal society at a time when feudal order, which had once been sustaining, had become crippling. <clears throat> the strength of this new social force can be judged by the fact that it survived the disasters of the 14th century, the Great Plague and, and the depopulation uh, which followed it, and having done so, began to build an internal organization and to find a name of its own and a vitality of its own. Those of you who remember Jan Heitzinger's The Waning of the Middle Ages will recall how he told there the story of despair, of decline of the aristocracy in the 15th century. But all the time that this was going on, the vulgar shoving rise of the bourgeoisie displayed a rough, not very attractive, vigor, but a vigor just the same. Chekhov wrote it all out for us in terms we can understand at a time when 19th century Russia was still straddling the divide between a feudal society and modern times. Those charming, ineffectual aristocrats whose cherry orchard grew a crop of dreams but not of fruit confronted Lopakhin, the bourgeois climber, and went down before him. We sympathize, we regret their fate, but should the world grow nothing but dreams? As fierce the old servant knew, the fruit from that orchard had once been sold profitably. The orchard had once fed its product into the real world. When it ceased to do so, other forces in the real world rose to reclaim the dream orchard and return it to use. A new use, of course, for Lepakhin had no intention of marketing cherries, he was planning a housing development. 
The middle class, that is, not only took over power from the aristocracy of the feudal world as the centuries passed, it invented new ways to do new things. New ways to live, new connections among human beings, not simply new knowledge, but new kinds of knowledge. Now this didn't happen because of any sudden mutation in the human race. It happened because a whole order of society was given an opportunity for the first time to use the minds and energies and imagination of its members. They smashed the old order in a sort of fit of absent-mindedness just because it got in the way. And in so doing, they made the Renaissance, Reformation, Enlightenment, ideas of democracy, science, the modern world, and created a society that was unimaginable in the world that had given it birth. One of the things it has created is a female sex that is ceasing to be second and subordinate and is beginning to come together. Around us again, a world sometimes seems fading toward a dying fall as its hope and its imagination fail. That is the world the bourgeois revolution made. So perhaps it's time for a new force to venture out. Do I mean a female revolution? Not exclusively, of course. But because women are the repository of the largest store of unused abilities, they will surely be a primary source and resource of ideas and energy. <clears throat> I think it very possible that the fundamental irreverence with which women still look at man's world often, you know, the kind of thing where the most conservative and conventional good wife will say to another one, they're all little boys, aren't they? Mm -hmm. I think it's very possible that this fundamental irreverence will provide the answer to those who may deplore the tendency of women moving into the modern world to move also into men's roles. I don't see us really doing that. At the beginning, acting a male role is a valuable learning process. But even today, women are modifying masculine ways of doing things even within the business structure and certainly within the political structure. In the end, I suspect we are not simply going to modify man's world as the bourgeois modified the feudal world. We are also going to amplify it as they did. Man's world, the power world, is impoverished and in need of emotional values which will restore it to true human significance. They can't be thought up and pumped in like a transfusion of idealism. They will grow with new activities and with processes not yet conceived, but which will deal with areas of life now empty or abandoned to absurdity. The lonely crowd desperately needs new functioning communities. There's an enormous amount of work for such communities to do, linking individuals together, supporting isolated families. These communities may coalesce to meet felt needs which are now unsatisfied and unsatisfiable as things stand. They'll involve themselves in political action at all levels. They will begin to shape new structures of living and new connections between people. They will turn up rewards and pleasures we have as yet no way of picturing. They can begin anywhere where people come together at any level to achieve any sort of goal, great or small. Any aggregate can grow under the right circumstances into a snowballing movement. Such a world of ordinary daylight, one that lies not only be- Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org. Thank <laughs> you.